Thank you everyone for joining us this evening. I uh, would like to start with just a couple very brief uh, public service announcements, if I may, uh, before we start this lecture of uh, first in our series of Whatever Happened To, where we will go down kind of curiosity lane, different elements of our, the absolute most beautiful and only true religion in the world, and certain things which used to be very much a part of our religion and now our practices or culture and now just fall to the fell to the wayside at least to some extent taking those topics and trying to understand their origin the development their if the evolution uh through through the ages uh and the entire series is dedicated in the alias neshama towards lucy rena and raya d in israel the horrible tragedy that happened over pesach uh so some one of our members had the idea of dedicating some some learning in their honor, and uh, we are doing so. Uh, in particular, tonight, uh, we have a sponsorship as well. Uh, Jerry and Annie Cartman, thank you very much for the sponsorship. We sponsored tonight's class lecture in the honor, Annie, of your late father, Elio Ben Moshe. His neshama should have an aliyah, and thank you very much for your sponsorship. Uh, so now, I want to, before we actually get into the bread and butter of what we'll talk about tonight, uh, I heard once, someone once told me, when you get up to give a lecture or a talk, First you, tell you, first you tell people what you're going to say, then you say it, and then you tell people what you said, and then you say goodnight. So, the overview, right? This is going to be simply done in four steps, in four parts. Number one, I want to talk about the origin story, where the Karayim came from, where the Karaites came from, uh, and then we'll talk about their belief systems, what they believe, what they didn't believe. There is some confusion about that. There's actually, kind of historically, actually, the way the modern scholars think about it, there's almost two tracks of, who the, of the Karaite beliefs. Uh, and, and third uh, section, I want to talk about th their practices uh, and, and in turn, in certain cases, our counter practices. There's a lot of polemics that were practiced through the ages, some of them through practices and some, some of it in writing, and some of which we have even today, which we might not actually be aware of, that sometimes it's uh, some of our favorite things that we do every week are actually counter Karaite practices, and we'll get to that. Um, and, and lastly, I want to talk briefly about their presence and status today. Uh, both, I want to talk about like, where they are uh, and how many Karaites there are nowadays, uh, and, uh, and, and also what is their status in like, the modern state of, of Israel if they're allowed uh, to get married with the Rabbanut, who's the, obviously the, the judicial, the, the halachic body uh, in Israel. Like, are they considered Jewish? Are they considered not Jewish? Well, as we'll see, they emanate from a very Jewish source. It's, it's just, it might get a little bit more complicated as they have been off the radar, quite literally, uh, for, for a very long time. Okay, so uh, the origin story. Yeah, last public service announcement is that there is Min Khamayev downstairs at 7.45. So I'm going to talk till just before 7.45. I already dava Mincha, so anyone who wants to stay up for questions could. Anyone who wants to, wants to go downstairs to catch Mincha could do that as well. Okay, let's start with the origin story. Now, every good culture, every good movement needs a good origin story. In my very humble opinion, Judaism has the best one. It's the only your origin story that even claims to have a, uh, a, a mass revelation where God, most religions, in fact, every other religion except for Judaism, starts with one guy telling one guy, last night when no one was looking, God came to me and said to me X, Y, and Z. Do you buy it? Am I charismatic enough? And if the answer is yes, that guy could start a mass movement, aka religion. But there's no other world religion that claims that God originally came when everyone was looking, when two million people were at Har Sinai at the sign of Revelation and heard that. It's a very unique uh, origin story. Now, obviously, uh, although the Karaites originally, as we will see, did define themselves as their own religion, as we will see the fascinating story, but they, of course, for the vast majority of their beliefs and their basic tenets, obviously, there's some major and very important fundamental tenets that they don't share with Judaism, which is what's going to share them, set them apart, or at least what we call rabbinic Judaism, which is what we're all practicing today. Round of applause for you all, right? But, 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 but the Karaites, they started off with a very unique origin story, and once you hear our side of their origin story, it's not going to be such a shocking revelation to learn that if you look at their literature, you're going to have a little bit of a different story because the picture that we paint about when they broke off isn't all that positive. So if you belong to that movement, 
you're going to have a different writing of history, which is not, not surprising. Okay, but let's start with our origin story. So I, I like to see the origin story of the Karaites in two stages, okay? There was almost like the inspiration story, but it never really took off. But then later in history, at a very specific time in history, there was like a leader that like the, the movement was missing everything except for like a fantastic charismatic leader that was really going to take that belief that was kind of shaky and, and just uh, believed in in a very sporadic local way but never created a full movement and he coalesced those people that believed in it into, into movement. So these two things separate themselves by hundreds of years. The first inspiration story, uh, and, and this is according to what we say our version of history and the Karaite version, if you look at their own literature, they would both point to this moment uh, in history where uh, this time period where they where it started. And I'll invite you right into the first page of your source of your source sheets uh, to source number one. I just realized right now they actually failed to put in the source itself where this is, but it should sound pretty familiar. It's from the first parrot, the first chapter of Pirkei Avos, Pirkei Avot, our Mishnayos, uh, the third Mishnah. And it tells us like this. Antigonus ish Socho kibel mi Shimon Atzadik. So Antigonus, the man of Socho. So he was a student of Shimon Atzadik. Shimon Atzadik, for about 40 years, was the Kohen Gadol in the second temple, in the second base of Mikdash. So we're talking before the second base of Mikdash was destroyed. Okay, so in that generation, so he said the following statement, that Al-Tihiyu ka'avadim ha-misham shenes ha-rav al-manas l'kabal pras, al-lahavi ka'avadim ha-misham shenes ha-rav shalom al-manas l'kabal pras. You shouldn't be like a servant who's serving the master with the expectation of receiving reward. But rather, you should go into your day's work to the Almighty without the expectation of receiving reward. reward. And the more in, 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 in sincere you are about serving Hashem, the message was the greater reward you're going to reap. Right? It's, count, it's like a counter logic. Right? The more you don't want the reward, the more reward you're going to get. Because if, you don't, if you're doing it just because you love it and not because you, you want payday, so then you're going to be more of a passionate server, Jew, and you're going to excel more than other Jews. That's, that's what he was, that, that was the message that he was trying to convey that on that fateful day, okay? But there was two people in the crowd. If you look at the continuation of source number one, it is a different source, but it is the Pirish HaRambam. The Rambam, I don't think we need to in, introduce uh, uh, too much, but uh, one of the very influential arguably the most influential medieval scholars that we have. Uh, he was the chief rabbi of, uh, he was of, of Egypt, of Cairo for many years, uh, and he was this top doctor, top scientist, and he was really the absolute, uh, uh, absolute thought leader of Judaism in his time. And the Rambam, the way he explained, in his explanation of this Mishnah, he tells us something that was passed down generation after generation through our oral tradition, that there was two people in that classroom on that fateful, fateful day when Antigonus Ish Socho taught that message that I just taught you about, that, that we just reviewed together about serving God in a sincere way. And let's just jump straight to the bolded translation of the Rambam. Okay, they went out from in the front of him, and as they left the classroom, and one said to, 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 to there's two students, one was named Sadok, and one was named, named Baitos. And they heard the statement, and they left the classroom with the Huff and the Huff. And they said, behold, our teacher just said explicitly that there is no benefit, and there's no reward and punishment for a person, so there's no hope at all. They misunderstood the lesson that day. And they thought that Antigonus Isoka was saying, there is no reward and, publish, and punishment. They thought, wow, Judaism is like nihilism, and nothing matters because there's no reward, there's no punishment. So if I speak negatively about you and I steal from your pocket when you're not, when you're not looking, there's no accountability because that's what these rabbis are teaching. Let's get out of here. And they left Judaism as fast as they could, predicated on a misunderstood statement in yeshiva on that fateful day. Okay, so they left. As they did not understand the, the, the teacher's intention. And one strengthened the other's hand of his friend and they exited, uh, and they exited the group and left the Torah, right? And then the Rambam goes on to explain that these are the Sadducees and the Baitusis, right? So these, we don't know about the Karaites yet. They don't exist. It's going to take a lot longer in history to get to where they are. But on this day, already in the second Beis HaMikdash, the second temple period, there was this implanted, this idea, this, uh, this idea which, which is going to possess the, a minority of the Jewish people for hundreds of years, 
which is as following, very simple statement. The rabbis are not representing the Torah properly. They're taking too much leeway, they're making up their new halakhos. You look at the Gemara, they take a pasuk, I'm saying this sarcastically, representing the Baitusim and the Tzadukim, the people who are the anti rabbinates right? And they said they were taking a, a verse in the Torah and they were extrapolating it for a whole new law. They were making up their own holidays like, uh, like Hanukkah, Purim, Purim and Hanukkah. These are rabbinic laws and they're saying blessings. Asher Kedishonu, Mitzos Vitzivanu, and God commanded us. God never commanded you to light the Hanukkah candles. Open up the five books of Moshe, the Chamisha Chumshay Torah, or all the books of the prophets, which they believed in, just as much as we did. And it doesn't mention Hanukkah at all, obviously, because that would be impossible on a historical standpoint, because Hanukkah happened after the closing of Tanakh. So, so you're making up your own holidays, your, your own halachos, and, and because the Torah juxtaposes this concept with that concept, you're learning new halachos out. We disagree with all of this. The license that the rabbis are taking all for the name of Torah, representing the Torah. We don't. We, we, we disagree with you, the license that the rabbis are taking. So they went off to create their, their own sect of Judaism, let's call it for now, which simply stated, a lot of people think that they don't believe in Torah Shabbat, which means the oral Torah. We believe that given at Har Sinai was a duality of the written Torah and the oral Torah. And the reason why we need the oral Torah is because the written Torah says, guys, put on the tefillin, the phylacteries, the totafot. Great. Are they blue? Are they red? Are they circle? Uh, where do we put them? Are there, are there straps? No details in the Torah. So, and it says, and it says in the Torah, make sure to eat kosher meat, slaughter your meat. How do you, do, how do you slaughter a, piece, a, a cow properly? You cut off the legs and let it bleed out. What, what do you do? No description whatsoever in the, in the written Torah. So that teaches us that there must be a, 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 a tandem Torah that was given to us that was meant to pass down from generation to generation, and we call that the oral Torah, the, the Torah Sheba al and we believe it's alive and well through the Mishnah, through the Gemara, and through all the commentaries that try to understand this tradition. Yet we admit that certain stages of history, certain parts of the tradition became not so clear to us, hazy, uh, so we had an argument about it. Hillel said this, Shammai said that, and we have a mechanism how to figure out for us lay people what to do, being that the rabbis argued about it. There's lots of focus, lots of debate, and we have a halachic structure, how to figure out what we do in the wake of that debate. But the, these tzedukim and baitusim says the rabbis are full of it. They're, 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 they're making stuff up. We disagree with their process. They're taking too much of a license. They're, they're just on, they're in it for their own power. So we disagree with their license. So it's not that they don't, it's not that they don't have any sense of an oral tradition, but they disagree with our oral tradition. And they take other, usually more literal or symbolic, as we'll see, uh, either literal or symbolic meaning of the Torah, of, of, of let's say, for tefillin, as we'll see, they say it's just a symbol, and modern day Karaites don't wear tefillin. It's kind of a misnomer that they read it, they, they wear it in between their eyes, because the Torah says, Bain Einechem. They don't really, and they never really did that, but they understand that the tefillin is more of a concept, more of a symbol that you have to live with Hashem every day, that the message, the, names, the name of Hashem needs to be constantly upon your head, between your eyes and on your arms. You have to live with God and think about God. It's more symbolism and they, they do a lot of that. But they disagree with our mode of the oral tradition and the way we have extracted, the, the, the rabbis of previous generations have times of the Mishnah, the Gemara, the, the Mishnah and Gemara interpreted the law. So, but this idea never really took off, as they say. It was an idea that did pollute the minds of individuals, but it never was created into a movement. But that was all going to change in around the ninth century, in the period of the Go'onim. The Go'onim were the, the, the title that we give the rabbis who lived right after, almost right after, the closing of the Gemara, of the Talmud. So we're talking around the ninth century, that they lived, uh, certain Go'onim, although they were, they were the minority, lived in Israel. Most of them were living in what we used to call Babylonia, what we call now Iraq, Iraq partly Iran, some of them. But Iraq nowadays, most of them, right? Babylonia, Babel. And they were living, uh, and this is actually an important, uh, important point to realize when it comes to understanding the, the origin story of the, of the Karayim, which we're about, we're, about to, we're about to see it blossom in the ninth century, that who was the, 
the real, uh, in the ninth century, it's right at the beginning of the golden era of Islam. And that was, it was, you know, Iran and all, all around the Gaonim, the real political powerhouses were the caliphs and the, uh, and, and, and the Islamic leaders. Uh, but, and the sultans, but it wasn't the rabbis. Now the rabbis, because we were such, uh, we were a religion with, with such pedigree, you know, the way that Islam, they, they view Judaism uh, at, at an incredibly high degree, it's just, we don't accept Muhammad, but that's like the, but, but besides that, they think of us as like unbelievable, like they believe in the, in, the, in, in the Torah of Moshe. Moshe was, to them, the second greatest prophet. Okay, to us, he was the first greatest, greatest prophet, but definitely the closest religion to Judaism is Islam, and they, they saw that back then. So Jewish people in the times of the Go'onim had a lot of rights. They were able to climb very high up in the political, uh, in the political world as well. And there was always, for each Jewish, for each generation, there was all these great rabbis. Go'onim, which was a very serious accolade. Not everyone could get up and say, oh, I'm a Go'on. You had to be really given the, the smicha, the ordination to be a Go'on of that time. And one Go'on was picked to be the Nasi which means like the exlar, the absolute, you know, the chief rabbi of the Jewish people of that generation. And what happened is there was this one great scholar by the name of Anan ben David. Anan ben David, right? And he was the one, again, we, we, the way our, our documentation is a little bit of a power struggle. Uh, he wanted to, so where am I getting this from? Source number two, right on the top of your second page is a sefer called Sefer HaKabbalah which was written by the rival. Now, I'm not going to get into this in too much detail, but there are a few different Rishonim that we call the rival because the rival is just a, an abbreviation of Rav, Avraham, Ben, David. Like how many Avrahams named their child? How many Davids in those times named their son Avraham? They're both very common names. So within a span of about 150, 200 years, we have very three very but separate very important people in our history called the Rivet. The first Rivet, the Rivet Har, you know, Harishon, that's the one we're referring to over here. And he wrote Sefer Kabbalah. The second Rivet, very quickly, he wrote another very famous work called Sefer HaEshkel. The third and final one that we refer to in, in the literature of the Rishonim, he's the most famous one. He was the one who wrote his glosses arguing with the Rambam in much of the Rambam's literature. So he's the one who gets most of the fame. We're referring to about 150 years before that famous Ravid, the Ravid Harisham. Okay, the first Ravid, Rav Ram Ben David. So he wrote Sefer HaKabbalah. Why did he write Sefer HaKabbalah? Because it's, it's the Karayim at the time, right, he's already beyond the ninth century. He's in the medieval times, in the, in the early 12s, I would, I, you know, early 1200s in Spain. So he, he, he the Karayim even then were arguing that the rabbis never had a clean tradition. They kind of made it up. They didn't know what to do because the Torah was unclear. So they woke up one morning and just started writing the Mishnah. But it wasn't an oral tradition like we believe that dates back to Harsina. So in order to combat that argument against the rabbinic Judaism, so he wrote Sefer HaKabbalah, which is essentially, Kabbalah doesn't mean like mysticism, that word did not pick up that modern day, relatively modern day connotation till much later on in history. This Kabbalah just means tradition, right? So it literally is a history book of like, this rabbi was a student of that rabbi and this is what he learned for X amount of years. He passed that, our tradition down to the next rabbi, to the next rabbi, to the next rabbi. And he goes through all the different periods of Jewish history proving that there was never a break, okay? And in one little paragraph when he's talking about the Gaonic periods, he mentioned this rabbi named the Anan ben David, who started the Karai movement. And he felt that he wanted to be a Go'on. He wanted to be a big rabbi. But the rabbis at the time, because they realized that there were certain things in his belief system that wasn't going to represent rabbinic Judaism, they picked that up when he was a young man, and they said, no, you can't be a Go'on. And then he wanted to be the exilarch, he wanted to be the chief rabbi, because his father, his uncle, was the chief rabbi, was the exilarch, was the Nazi, was the chief rabbi. So he felt he should be the next one in line. I think his brother got it instead of him, and it describes that he was very angry. So what did he do? He broke off, and like any powerful person who wanted, who wanted the ears of the masses but didn't get it, he started his own thing. But again, it's important to realize we're in the ninth century when Islam is in their golden era. One thing Islam does not like is heretics. I don't care if you're a heretic of Islam or a heretic of the Jewish people. The Jewish people are a respectable nation with a respectable religion. And they, they pray to the same God, and now I'm a Muslim talking, that we pray to. So this guy, Anand ben David, so he's a heretic of the Jewish people, 
lock him up, put him in jail. And that's exactly what they did. And he was on death row, he describes. He was going to get killed. And someone, one of his jailmates in cell, one of his cellmates in jail, said, I have a great idea for you. Yiddish a cup over here. Why don't you tell the Islamic leaders, the caliph at the time, tell them that, no, you're not a Jewish heretic. You're a different religion. You're the true Judy. You're arguing on the, on, on the fundamentals of Judaism, and you're not Jewish. You're a different religion. He said, that's a good idea. He argued, and he got off death row, and he got released because he's not a heretic. He's a different religion. And because that was such a public scene, every single individual who happened to have, belie- have this belief system of the rabbis are full of it, they're making this stuff up, for the past hundreds of years had this, uh, this, uh, this, uh, this, this ideo- ideology in their mind, in their family tradition, they all coalesced under this newfound spiritual leader, charismatic leader, Anan ben David. He wrote his own commentaries on the Chumash, explaining that, no, that's not what this, this, it means, it's what this means, and the rabbis are wrong about this. This is how it goes. And he simply, he essentially created his own structure for Judaism, right? And he argued on, on, on the, the facets of Judaism. Okay. It's about, and, and, and you might think, well, okay, you know, in the times of the Rishonim it, that lived in Spain and France, and today, as we'll get to, they're not a force to be reckoned with. But in the ninth century, when the, and, and much later in, in, in Egypt, when the Rambam was kind of combating this ideology, this was simply uh, quite, uh, really a war uh, about the hearts of the civil Jew. This was really dividing the Jewish people. In fact, I'm sure you've read at some point about the Cairo Geniza that was found. So in the Cairo Geniza, one thing that was found was, was a whole, hundreds and hundreds of ketubot, ketubas from weddings. And amongst those ketubas from weddings, we found a, quite a few examples of, just for simplicity's sake, I'll call it intermarriage between uh, a, a rabbinic Jew marrying a Karite Jew. Okay, and in source number three, I have a, a line or two from the ketubah, which is essentially uh, the ketubah is they're signing this marriage agreement that they are going to compromise, compromise on their ideals. Parenthetically, you know how many signatories are on our ketubahs? Two. On a Karite kasuva, there's ten. Right? So it's not always that like they're more lenient than us. They have a different way of thinking, and in certain aspects, they're actually more strict, right? So they have 10 signatories on their ketubah, but fine. So it says over right here that, I'll just read you the, these lines in source number three. Lo yavi el beiso asher hi bo, vihi yose ishto aleha, velo shte hakalias, velo yoseras hakavi. Right, you can't bring certain parts of the animals, certain fats, that the Karaites believe to be true. The Karaites could have a cheeseburger, right? I, I found this uh, Karaite, uh, he has a YouTube channel nowadays, right? And he's like a Karaite thought leader. So he talks about like you're allowed to have a a, uh, a cheeseburger because the Torah says lo tevashel gedi b'chalevimo don't cook a kid in its mother's milk. So they don't cook a kid in its mother's milk, but they can eat it if it's once it once from a you know a this animal once from that animal or it's, it's not a fa- fa- mother daughter son relationship between uh, the milk and the meat. So you can eat a cheeseburger, but apparently. Uh, in all, every Israeli, you know, like the shawarmas are made so that fat on top is dripping down at a very high temperature, which is actually cooking the outer layer of the meat. So that fat that we use on top that drips down to cook the meat, that's prohibited fat for the Karaites. So they can't have any shawarmas in Israel. So that's, right? So cheeseburgers, yes, but shawarmas, no. So they just have a different line of thinking. Okay, so that's what this is referring to. Velo yavir ner belel shabasas. You can't, and, and, and he's basically saying, sweetie, I love you, but I'm a Karite, and you're a rabbinic Jew, and if you're marrying me, I want, I want, I want my laws to be followed, so I don't want you to light Shabbos candles. Because Shabbos, that's one of the main differentiating factors, that, as we'll see in a moment, that Karites don't have Shabbos candles. We have Shabbos candles. They say, oh, Rabbi's made up this whole Shabbos candles thing. The Torah says, don't light candles on Shabbos, so why are you lighting a candle before Shabbos? Okay, Veloya Babeso Esh Bimea Shabbos is no nothing hot, no lights, no candles, no heat in their entire Shabbos. It's gonna be a cold and dark Shabbos if you want to marry me. She signed off on it. Okay? Etc. One of the huge differences is they disagreed with the fixed calendar that Hillazaki uh, almost 2,000 years ago established, and they every month will establish a new month based on when they see the new moon. Right, so they're saying, don't force me to hold of your Yom Kippur, I want to hold of my Yom Kippur. So they're basically making a compromise in their marriage of saying, I'm a Karite, you're a rabbinic Jew, and we're marrying each other, 
So as much as the rabbis of that generation were saying the Karaites are bad and don't listen to them, don't marry them, but the marriages were taking place because we know, because we found hundreds of them in the Cairo Geniza like this. So this was something that was a real battle for the Jewish people at the time. Okay, uh, one other thing I'll do before we go to some examples of their belief system is I want to point out two very uh, two other important thought leaders in the Karaite tradition. Number one is Benjamin Nahwandi, Nahwandi, and he was a contemporary of Rav Sa'ajagon. And according to many scholars and if you, uh, that, that studied the writings firsthand, so Nahwandi is considered really the father of modern day Karaite for whatever there is. It's about 50,000 Karaites. Today, about 40,000 live in Israel and 10,000 in, in America. Uh, and, and they're really following Nahwandi's Karite movement, which shifted things a little uh, more from literal translation to symbolism translation. He, he emphasized that a little bit more, as we'll see. Some modern scholars actually differentiate between a Karite and an Ananite. Who is it? What's an Ananite? An, uh, Anan ben David, right? That was the original leader that we spoke about a moment ago. But Nahwandi, he, 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 diff, he, he actually had a different path of understanding the Torah based on this tradition of the rabbis are full of it, they're making this stuff up. Now, what do we do from there? We've got to do something, right? What do we do with the words in the Torah that say tefillin? So he took a less literal approach and went more, more for a more symbolic approach. Okay, and then there's another one that's Daniel uh, Al-Kumisi. And his significance is he actually did a lot of writing down for their tradition. At the beginning of his career, he referred to Anan ben David, the original thinker, as like the Rosh Hamas, uh, Hamas Kilim, the greatest thinker, and he was a real student of the Anan ben David's way of thinking of it. But at the end of things, he, he referred to uh, Anan ben David as the Rosh ha, 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 Haksilim, the, the, the head of the idiots, essentially. And he, he went away from the Anan, Anan way of thinking of it, and he adopted more of ben, Benjamin Nahwandi, and that's really why that he's seen as the uh, modern day father of, of care, the, the father of modern day Karaites, because the uh, Daniel Al Kamisi really, towards the end of his career, was committing himself to that. Okay, so now let's look at a few different practices, okay? Source number five, uh, just to realize that Kara'im, when you see it in Hebrew, uh, you can understand why they're called Kara'im, right? So I wrote down Kara'im, and then I broke it up into two words, Kara'im, right? Which literally, you would translate that like a Kra is an Aramaic word for a verse, right? It's a Pasuk in the Torah. So if you translate Kara'im, it means like the scripturists. I made that word up, but it means the people who are committed to understanding the scripture directly, and not relying on any tradition that the rabbis might claim they have on how to understand the scripture. We'll, we'll, we'll decide ourselves what it means. For example, okay, source number six. This is Chacham Jacob ben Ruben, who apparently wrote a sefer in the 11th century called Sefer HaOsha. Never seen it myself. It's not in any collection of books I would have because this is a Karite, a Karite, a Karite, uh, like we have Rashi, so they have him. <laughs> Okay, so on the Pasuk uh, in, in, in Shemos uh, Yud Gimel uh, Tezayim, which is a, as a sign upon your hand, which is referring to the, for, to the to, to fill in, it says like this, this is his commentary. It is understood from this that his, God's word, are to be placed upon your hearts and it should not be understood according to what, it, what, what is heard, i.e. this is not literal, because the signs are emptiness, they are not physical. They are not the essence, i.e. the signs are not the main point, but the rabbinates understand that this verse applies to both fringes and to fill in. Both are literal, but the words have no strength. These are not literal. It just means that you have to kind of accept God's words on your arms and on your minds. More of a, it's, it's more of a creed. It's, it's a call. The tefillin is not a call to action. It's a call to creed. Very different than, than we understand things. Okay? But that's one big difference between us and them would be the, uh, how literal uh, the mezuzah or, or titsis uh, or, or tefillin, those, those, those mitzvahs would all be more of a thought, uh, a thought process for them. Okay, source number seven. Uh, you know, I, I think if you could join me in the statement that one of our favorite times of the week is the chalant that we eat, right? Why do we eat chalant on Shabbos? Right? Why do we eat chalant? Why, why is that such an old tradition to eat chalant on Shabbos? And most people are surprised to learn that it's actually a counter karite move, right? Why? Because the Torah tells us, Lo You can't, referring to Shabbos, do not have a fire in your house 
in your midst for the entirety of Shabbos. So we understand that, thanks to our rabbis, that what it means is don't light a fire, even though technically the grammar of the Pasuk is a little passive, like lo sevaru and a shouldn't be there, okay, there's what to argue about the grammar, but even if the grammar is lending to more of a passive commentation, we know from our tradition that what it means is don't light a fire. But if you have a fire lit before Shabbos and it continues into Shabbos, no problem. So according to the Karaites, you can't have any light or any heat, any fire, even if it's lit before Shabbos, exists in your house on Shabbos, it's impossible to have any hot food on Shabbos morning. Friday night you could because you could cook it all before Shabbos, and then I would say light the candles, but they don't light candles. But then right when sundown comes, you eat the hot food. But Shabbat morning, that's our custom, that's our tradition, I should say, to eat shalat or chamin on Shabbos morning. And the reason is because it proves that you're not a Karite. That's as simple as that. Look at this. In the Jewish Code of Law, the Ramar, Moshe Islis writes like this. It's a mitzvah to have hot food on Shabbos. Okay, if I would say it's a mitzvah to have shalant, I have to admit that's stretching it a little bit, but it's a mitzvah to have some hot dish, a soup, hot water, uh, a shalant, anything hot on Shabbos morning. Why? <coughs> First of all, he says because it's covered on Shabbos, it makes you enjoy uh, Shabbos more. And he says, mm-hmm. Those who aren't habituating themselves to have shalant or something hot on Shabbos morning, so then chayshinan shema apikarasu, we're worried that maybe he's a heretic, maybe he's a carrot. So it became our, our tradition to always have chalant. Okay? Source number eight. There's a beautiful tune. Ki Eshmera Shabbos. Right? Kel Yishmerani. It's a tune that many especially Sephardic because it was really more the, 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 uh, uh, the, the, the Sephardic countries of origin that were really battling against, uh, against the Karaites. And that's why in Ki Eshmeri Shabbat, most of the tunes that we have are more Sephardic sounding. But there's a line over there and I bolded it. Those who are sad on Shabbos are going to be thrown behind. What's that referring to? Well, the Ibn Ezra, one of the Rishonim, wrote this song. If you look at the first paragraph of each, uh, the first uh, letter of each paragraph of the song, it spells Avraham because the Ibn Ezra's name was Avraham, so he encoded his own name in the song. And over there it says, first of all, Yom Ta'anugim, it's a day of pleasure, it's a day when you're supposed to have hot food, and it's Hamis Avlombo Haim Ochran Esogim, and if you're sad on Shabbos because it's dark, because there's no candle lights, and it's dark because you can't have any fire or flames, and you can't have any hot food, so it's a sad day for the, for the, for the Karayim. So those are going to be thrown behind. So this is like a very subtle polemic against the Karayim movement by having this song part of our tradition. Okay, and, and this is all explained in source number nine, which I'll leave for now, but he's a scholar in Israel, of Daniel Sperber, who wrote, who wrote a multi-volume set called Minhage Yisrael, the different customs of the Jewish people, and he explains that Hamis Abel Lohem Achar Nisogim is a reference, is an anti karite reference in our songs. Now, source number 10, I think, is absolutely fascinating. Uh, I heard this from one of my teachers in Israel. And we mentioned already that the Rambam in Cairo was very much battling against the remnants of the Karite movement, and it was still strong in his time. And uh, it, the Rambam wrote a, 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 an absolutely uh, huge achievement of, of, of a work called the Mishnah Torah, the Yarechazaka, which was one of the first comprehensive codification of Jewish law, extrapolated from the Gemara, from the Talmud, into his work called the Mishnah Torah. And in there, he has 30 chapters of the laws of Shabbos. Okay? If I were to take a poll, if you were writing a book of Shabbos, what would the first chapter be about? It would probably be something very significant. Maybe you would go chronologically, like when Shabbos starts, you'd start with candle lighting or preparing for Shabbos, parenthetically like the Shulchan Aruch does, the Jewish code of law. Or maybe you would start with maybe the Da'araisa, the biblical laws first, and then, in, then get into the Rabbanan. But if you look at, the, the, I just myself did this chapter breakdown, of the 30 chapters of the Rambam and Mishnah Torah that, that talk about Hilchah Shabbos, the laws of Shabbos. The first cha- chapter is, okay, it's an introduction to Shabbos in general. The second chapter is referring to the laws of Pikuach Nefesh. In other words, that if there's a life on the line, you have to break Shabbos in order to save the life. Okay, and I'm just gonna, you'll understand where I'm going with it, but Kirayim don't believe in that. They don't believe that there's an exception. Uh, it, they, they, they won't actually let someone die because they don't want to do one of the malachos, but it's a whole different theology they have, but they don't agree to the idea that just because there's a life on the line, the whole Torah goes on pause. Uh, and, and three and four, the chapters of, of, of having something start before Shabbos, like turning on your crock pot, 
and having it cook into Shabbos. Two chapters dedicated to that. Okay, and the fifth chapter is candle lighting. The sixth chapter is asking a non-Jew to do malacha for you. And the seventh chapter finally gets to the 39 categories of malacha, which is a very counterintuitive model of how to approach, how to start a work on the laws of Shabbos. But if you look at the first five, six chapters, they're all on core values that rabbinic Judaism differ greatly compared to how the Karaites uh, look at Shabbos. And, and it's almost as if the Rambam is starting off his work on Shabbos as a sticket to them. As like, again, almost like, an anti, like a polemic work against the Karaites. This is what Shabbos is. Like, you know, even if he's dealing with the rabbinic laws first, but he's dealing with all the things that created controversy between the rabbinic Jews and the Karaites Jews, okay? Uh, source 11 is very interesting because we're doing this right now. So we know we're counting the Omer between Pesach and, Shav- and, and Shavuos. Right? And it, the Torah says in source number 11, hashabbat. Start counting the day after, literally translated, the day after Shabbos. So even today, the 50,000 Karaites around the room, after, after the first day of Pesach finished, they, they, they count the Omer starting, they wait whenever Shabbos is, and then the Sunday, the day after, the first Shabbos after Pesach, that's when they start counting the Omer, and 50 days after that is going to be Shavuos. So unless our Pesach, second night Seder, happens to be on Matzei Shabbos, their Shavuos will always be off, you know, three or four or five days compared to our Shavuos, because they're starting to count either earlier or after, because the Torah says count mi machoros Shabbos, okay? We know in our tradition that Shabbos here is referring to the day of Yom Tov, to Pesach itself, not actual Shabbos, okay? And it's, if you look at the first day of the Omer, this is in source number 12, the first day of the Omer that we count, Look at the test, text, it says, Hayom uh, Yom Echad Omer. Today is the first day of the Omer. Now, if you could hear this, compare that to this, which is a recording of the first night of the Karite Omer counting. Listen. Okay, first of all, nice, nice Chazan notes, right? But follow inside on source number nine, see if you can find a discrepancy. What does he say? Ayom yom rishon, not echad. What makes more sense? Rishon makes, what they do makes a lot more sense. Because echad means today is one. But hayom yom rishon means today is the first, which means tomorrow's gonna be the second. So anytime you're counting one, which is in a sequence, the the Hebrew word rishon is more appropriate. So why do we say echad? Because again, it's a counter, it's a counter Karite strategy. Because we don't want to say Hayom Yom Rishon Omer because that's the same, re- the same word that we use in Hebrew for Sunday. And they always count the Omer starting on a Sunday. So we don't want to say Hayom Yom Rishon because it sounds like we're Karaites. So we go for the grammatically less ideal version, Hayom Yom Echad Omer, just like we challenge, because we don't want to sound like we're, we're, we're Karaites, which is absolutely fascinating. That's the only reason why. There's other reasons as well. There's other reasons as well. Yes, yes, yes. Okay, I just want to... Mention again, I dove in for those that want to head down to Mincha. I'm going to be another seven minutes or so, then we'll take questions. Uh, but the recording will be available for anyone who wants to get, get to Mincha. Okay, so modern day Karaites, how are they appreciated or not appreciated in the modern day? So there is a battle about this in the early commentaries. Source number 13 and source number 14. They write Vaz, I have a little mini biography for you on the bottom of the page, who he was. That he writes that Kfarnish Alti al Pa'ami Macheros, I was asked about the status of the Karaites and the Halisi Shehem Mutarm Lavobakal. And I've already come to the conclusion that you're, it's permitted to marry them. In other words, they might disagree on some core values with us, but they're Jewish. And a Jew is a Jew. So do we say you can't, a, a religious Jew can't marry a non religious Jew? God forbid. A Jew is a Jew. You can get married to whoever you fall in love with, as long as they're Jewish or want to go through conversion. No problem. So the Radva says they're Jewish. Don't worry, you can marry them. Comes along the Beit Yosef, the Beit Yosef so Rabbi Yosef Cairo. And it's actually codified in source number 15 in the Ramah. It's actually interesting why Rabbi Yosef Cairo doesn't codify it himself, 
in the Shulchan Aruch, but that's besides the point. And he brings a tshuva from Rabbeinu Shimshon, which we don't really know too much about. And he writes the exact opposite, that Karayim she'asr li'ischatein bahem. It is prohibited to marry a Karayit, right? As we know, historically, it happened all the time, because we have tons of ketubot that we found, found in the Cairo Geniza. But the halacha, according to the Beis Yosef, according to the Ramah, was that it's prohibited to marry, and that's what's codified halachically speaking. So if we just take the book approach, we would say Karayits today are not considered Jewish, or at least we're not confident enough in their Jewish status that will permit marrying them, okay? Uh, Rav Yaakov Emden went so far, it, it, I have another little biography for you on the bottom of, of who he was, he went so far that uh, they're so not Jewish, if they want to convert, then they could convert if they want and be Jewish. But if, according to the previous opinions, they're, they're kind of the worst of both worlds because we kind of know they're Jewish, but they messed up their own uh, tradition so much because their marriages we see as kosher marriages, but the way they get divorced are not kosher ways of getting divorced. So they end up essentially being intermarried to each other as the generations go on. Because every time a divorce happens, hopefully they'll get remarried just for their own happiness in life. And when they get remarried, they were never really divorced from their first spouse. So they end up having what we call a mamzer, which is a really difficult category in, in, in Judaism to grapple with. But essentially a mamzer is prohibited to marry because they're the son of intermarriage, a child of intermarriage. So essentially they're Jewish, but they're all these intermarried products, so we can't, we can't even let them convert to Judaism. Where Yaakov Emden says, no, they're so not Jewish, the actual really non-Jews are Gentiles. So if they want to convert for us, then it's no problem. So that's his opinion. There's different levels of opinions. Now there's this beautiful article I found by Rabbi Shlomo Brody. On, I, I, wrote, I, I put the link here, which you could just type in, you can email me, uh, and you can get the digital version of this source sheet. Uh, but in Jerusalem Post, so he writes, so he is, uh, so, so he writes the following, and I just read these two paragraphs inside as a close. And he says, the status of Karite intrigues me daily as I pass the ancient Karite synagogue in Jerusalem's old city. In the Iri Tikka, there was a Karite show. And if you walk in, it looks like a Sephardic show. They have a Torah, they have a Bima, they prostrate on the floor, kind of like, like Islam, like the Muslims do when they, when they pray. So it looks like a hybrid between Judaism and Islam, but it's like, it's, it's really, it looks very familiar. So, et cetera, et cetera. Paragraph number two. Many Ashkenazi poskim, halachic decisors, adopted the more stringent opinion, while Sephardic rabbis tended to allow Jews to marry uh, repentant Karaites, you know, Karaites who left the, 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 the Karaite practices, but now wanted to be regular Orthodox Jews. They, that was no problem. Although exceptions exist in both directions, one later and one more extreme Ashkenazi position that ironically opened the door for leniency was of Yaakov Emden, which I just read for you. I'm gonna skip a couple more, and uh, I'm gonna start at the end of the line where it says, the rabbinate, which is the modern rabbin, uh, you know, the rabbinate in Israel today. Uh, the rabbinate, however, uh, remains sharply divided over the ability of Karaites and their descendants to marry Jewish Israelis. While prominent Ashkenazi decisors, Rabbi Avram Sherman, in, uh, in, in a halachic journal called Tehumim, and Rabbi Eliezer Waldenberg, famous the Tzitz Eliezer, uh, harshly criticized such marriages. Two former Sephardi chief rabbis, Rav Vadya Yosef, famously, and Rav Elio Bakshi Doron, adopted more lenient positions, especially in cases when these Karaite descendants had no loyalty towards their ancestors' rituals. While such cases remain rare, they nonetheless represent a fascinating chapter in the ongoing struggles over personal status and marriage in Israel. And I believe today they have essentially their own category where they have to get married within the rabbinate, but the rabbis don't sign off on their marriages, but they allow it to take place with the Karaite rabbis, which you can't do if you're just a random uh, you know, Jewish person in Israel. You have to get through, married through the rabbinate. You know, I went through it myself, had to get a marriage certificate in Israel. Whole long story. But you have to go and essentially get married by rabbis. Uh, but the Karaites are allowed to get formal Israeli stamped marriage certificates but with their rabbis. So it's kind of like, we don't really know what to do with you, we'll kind of allow it to happen, but we won't put our names on it, which is, which is indicative of this struggle that modern rabbis have, how to relate to, to the Karaites, uh, to this Karaite tradition, because they came from a Jewish uh, lineage, that's for sure, there's no argument about that, but possibly their, 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 their carefulness about how to get married, or the similarity is to, to how they get married compared to us with two witnesses, with the ring, etc is enough for us to see, well, that's a remarriage, that is a real marriage, but the way they get divorced is not, 
or the way they perform conversions, for example, could be uh, not to our standards or, or, or not even close to our standards. So because that could have been going on for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years, by the time we get to 2023, who are we looking at? Are they Jews? Are they not Jews? We don't really know. So the, to this day, the rabbis in Israel are grappling with this uh, anomaly and interesting chapter in Jewish history. Yes. Do they have a Siddur? They have a Siddur. Good question. They have a Siddur. In the Siddur is basically Tehillim and different Psukim from the Torah. They do not have a Shemona Esri. No Amidah. Because the Amidah was written by the rabbis of the Second Temple. The very rabbis that started the whole, hey rabbis, you're making too much up. We're leaving you. Those are the rabbis that created the Amidah, the Shemona Esri. So they have a Siddur which is basically Tehillim, which is from David HaMelech, and different Psukim from around Tanakh. Do they call the army? Do they? They go to the army. Uh, the army. Do they go to the army? To the uh, yes, they go to the yes. They, they are yes. The ones in Israel go to the army. Yeah, yeah. Perhaps I missed it. What's their relationship to the modern state of Israel? Good. So the modern state of Israel is trying to figure out where to place them. They go to the army. They're allowed to 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 uh, solemnize their own marriages within the state of Israel, not with the state of Israel's rabbis, but they allow Karaite rabbis. To, uh, to, okay. to assume their do own they lines. serve in the Israeli army? They do, yeah. Yeah. Yes? Uh, are the Shomronim a sect of the Karaites? Yes, the Shomronim were, yeah, they were an early sect of the, before it became formalized through the Anan and then later it Al Qasimi, so then, then they were kind of a sect that became coalesced together later on in history. Oh, interesting. So it could be I'm not, not, not knowledgeable. If they still exist now, it could be I'm not sure what the difference is. Huh? I don't think that they are a sect of the... Uh, oh, but they have some similar type of anti-rabbinic... Yes, that they have literal observance of the Torah. Uh -huh. Okay, so okay. They have their own... They, they sit at the door and watch On Shabbos. So similar, yeah. similar thing. And they have mezuzah. On the oh, they do. So Karaites don't have a mezuzah. That I know. Okay. Karaites don't have a mezuzah? Karaites don't. It's symbolic. Well, it's like tefillin. It's symbolic. You have to have like a Shem's name in your house. Type of thing. Right. Any other kind? They, they have like fringes that they braid together and they look at. They don't wear them, but it says Uri Itemotam. So they have certain times. I saw like a video uh, that they look at them. It's very interesting. I saw on YouTube, if you type in uh, Kerite Havdalah, you'll get, it'll look like a regular Moroccan Havdalah. That's really, they have the same tune. There's one difference. For some reason, right, and not until I was doing research the past couple of weeks would I have been able to understand this, they're doing it outside the synagogue. This is the synagogue and I think Petach Tikva, the Karaite synagogue. They're doing it outside. Why are they doing it outside? Because Karaites are not allowed to bring any wine or grape juice inside their synagogues. Asur. It's like a little Islamic. As long as no, they don't have any alcohol. They don't have alcohol in their sanctuary. Why? And they also don't blow shofar on Rosh Hashanah. Why? Because we don't have the Beit HaMikdash. How could you be happy? Enjoy alcohol, enjoy levity in the sanctuary? At your house, fine, a little bit. But in the sanctuary, in the house of God to celebrate with wine? There's no base of mikdash. How could you? Chutzpah, right? So they, they have this very intense reality of churban base of mikdash, which we do too. But they express it a lot in their religious, not just during the three weeks and the nine days on Tisha B'Av, but they're constantly, in fact, when the, you remember I mentioned the three scholars, the second scholar that was a contemporary to, um, uh, to, uh, to Rav Sa'ajagon, Benjamin Nahwadi. So when he made Aliyah to Israel, he started a synagogue which is still around today in Yerushalayim. What's it called? It's called Beit Knesset Avelei Tzion, the mourners of Tzion. Because they wore the destruction of the Beit Hamikdash on their sleeve, and we do too, right? I'm not trying to, but, but they vary. There's a lot of practices that they have uh, that, that are indicative of we're sad now. We are sad people. We're not going to enjoy Shabbos. We're not going to enjoy, you know, uh, you know, uh, alcohol in our synagogues because because we don't have the base to make that. So that's, yeah, that's another differentiating factor. Okay. We they study the Torah. Sorry. Yeah, they study the Torah. Yeah. So, but if they study, they have to interpret the Torah. So they have their ways. They have their commentaries. They interpret it literally so or symbolically. So it's uh, like a rabbi. They have rabbis. So. <laughs> Yeah, they have rabbis. They are in the, yeah, rabbis. so it's right. So it's a misnomer that they don't believe in an oral tradition. They don't believe in the traditional oral tradition. They have their own tradition, which they made up in second century. Right? Yeah.
No, you mentioned the calendar before, but the, the reason that they don't observe the calendar is because they believe that there are errors within the calendar because it all has to tie into the agriculture of Israel Correct. in terms Correct. of when the barley is right. Correct. Or, in the past 1900 years. Bear and, and so on and so forth. Correct. So, so strictly speaking, although it averages out, well, right. Genius. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's ingenious. ingenious. We we've but lost like, maybe two weeks in the past yes, nineteen hundred years. Yes, but in a given year, it yeah. might be just plain wrong. Correct. Okay. In Correct. terms of what is going on agriculturally speaking. Yeah, yeah. Being that it's only going to be off a little bit, if it ever, right? The Torah only tells us that Pesach needs to be bechodesh ha'aviv in the yeah. springtime. It doesn't define us. They have when the barley is ripe, which is like one of three days. They go out and check the barley yeah. and then decide when Pesach is going to be. Um, so we believe in our tradition, the reason why Hillel Hazakim was able to make the fixed calendar is because the Torah wasn't being so specific that Pesach needs to be on those three days, which is like the height of Aviv. It needs to be in the month of Aviv. It can't fall out like Ramadan falls 11 days behind every year. So sometimes it's in the summer, sometimes it's in the winter. So that the Torah wanted the Jewish people to jive the lunar and solar calendar enough that Pesach remains in the springtime, which, which the genius of Hillel Azakin has, has succeeded also, to Also, a strong uniting factor. Yes. For, uh, yeah, yeah. Which they don't know. Yeah. Okay, well, thank you for coming. We're back here in a couple weeks on another fascinating topic of the script, the text that we actually write our Torah scrolls in. Was it the same text that we actually received at Har Sinai? And if it's different, why and where did we change that? Yes, Koach, and good evening. Thank you very much. Yeah, the press. Yeah, a pair of toughs.